Hey, what's up? Rafael Cortez here, back on the CEO Pulse podcast. Today, we are sitting down with Jessica Fiakovic, the founder of Exit Factor. Uh, we're going to tackle a, a subject that I think, I mean, I advocate for quite frequently, and this is actually buying a business that's in place as opposed to coming in and then doing the whole startup thing. Uh, sometimes, if you're in the position to do so, it can be the best um, approach. However, there's a lot of questions that come, you know, come about with you know, uh, looking at a business, the ins and outs of you know what it what it takes to really buy something that you can come in and flip and add value to it and then make it your own right um, there's a lot of stuff that happens there and uh, Jessica is an expert at this she's been at it uh, since she was uh, 25 years old and now she owns a, a very successful brokerage and, and over the last eight years she's been able to expand that uh, now she's in multiple different locations and I mean currently uh, Jessica you have interest in five existing businesses you built uh, eight businesses so far or you know gone through that process right so mm -hmm. I want to tap into that um, pick your brain on the mindset uh, that it takes to get from point A to point B uh, especially when you're some when you're buying something that's not yours and it's not completely you know the ins and outs are not defined um, and then just you know go to town on, on this whole process because it's exciting and I've never had anybody in the show that really talks openly about it so thank you for being with us I appreciate it <laughs> oh thank you so much yeah I'm so excited to be here and just share any knowledge I have about buying businesses. Um, you know, like I said, I've been doing it, um, with my brokerage firm for the last eight years, but I've done it personally a few times now mm. as well. Nice. Uh, so, and, and you started, you kicked it off when you were 25 years old. Uh, tell me a little bit uh, about you, your background. How yeah, did you so figure out the business was the, the way? Yeah. So actually like I, I didn't have that entrepreneurial, um, mindset when I was younger. Like I wasn't the kid selling lemonade on the streets. Right. Really? Um, yeah. My mom was a nurse. My dad, uh, is in education, but my grandfather owned his own businesses. So I went the corporate route for the first few years of my career. And I actually worked for NHL and NFL teams. Mm. And during, um, the recession, um, when 08, 09 hit, I was actually in, at, at that time I had switched to corporate real estate development and had um, my job suspended just because of everything that was going on in real estate. And there was just like this shift of like, you know, this whole time I'd been taught that these big corporate jobs were safe. Right. Yeah. And I had the big corporate job and, you know, but what happened was my job got eliminated by, you know, some dude sitting in New York who had no, no idea who I was. It's just like <laughs> cost cutting slash. Right. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. So that's when it, it shifted for me. And I was like, you know, actually the best safety is to create something of my own and do something on my own. Um, so my first business that, that I started actually with my now husband, was in the wine industry. Um, I, there wasn't a whole lot of thought that went into it. Like I had a friend that had, that had a luxury wine retail store and he did really well. So it's like, I'm just going to copy <laughs> his concept and open it in a different location. And wine and sign about, me up. Yeah. Yeah. That was about as, I mean, I was, you know, like I said, I was 25 and I was like, yeah, if I could sell wine and drink wine all day, this sounds great. Um, <laughs> so yeah. So we, we lasted in that business about 30 months before we exited. Um, and through that exit process is how I got introduced to selling and buying businesses and, mm -hmm. and thinking of like, Hey, you actually don't have to start from scratch every single time. Um, and, and I really found a niche in that brokerage space. So you exited, uh, 30 months after you started, or you jumped into your fir uh, first business, basically it, it was a startup. You copied the model. Did you guys bootstrap it? And it was all you guys trying to figure out how to put pieces together, like you know, regular standard bootstrap, um, operation. Yeah. And, totally and, and boot yeah, totally bootstrapped. Yeah. We, um, we used our severance from our corporate careers. Um, you know, we leveraged financing terms for our suppliers. Um, but yeah, we had no outside financing, no outside debt, um, did it from scratch. I mean, in hindsight, it's actually like kind of a blessing to start a business in the middle of the recession because really nobody has money at that point. So like <laughs> everybody's getting creative and, mm -hmm. and you can be more negotiable with your vendors is what we found. Um, especially cause like, you know, our, our suppliers, like our competition wasn't buying any inventory. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, they were just excited to have a new player in town, but yeah, bootstrap the whole thing. It's interesting uh, that you mentioned that, but yeah, it's a little bit off topic, but I think chaos has this, the psychological effect of bringing people together. Like people just, okay, we're in this together. Even if yeah. they don't know you, right? But yeah, it, it's interesting how that happens, especially when you see the, uh, uh, you know, the the uh, the ups and downs of of um, uh, of the market and 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 finance altogether. Um, 
bootstrapping, I have a, a particular passion for bootstrapping businesses, right? It's kind of like, it, I think at the beginning, the dream of getting, you know, something um, in place and having it grow its own legs and, and take off and then just create something from, you know, a vision, right? It, it, it has that whole um, glorious feel to it. Uh, however, it, it, if you're in the 100%, if you're in the position to come in and then buy something that's already structured, you're going to save yourself a lot of headaches. Yeah. <laughs> if you yeah. know how to come in and fine tune it, what to look for, right? Um, did you uh, did you guys do well on that business or, or was it one of those learning lessons that, uh, you know what, it, it's we just have to exit? Um, yeah. No, we did actually really well. We exited at the right time. So our, our biggest profit center at the time was selling luxury wine online. Um, mm. So we were selling like wine that you know, 500 to $25,000 a bottle to collectors mm -hmm. all over the US and Canada. And we were doing really well. And then this guy named Gary Vaynerchuk, um, probably your <laughs> listeners have heard of him. I was going to, um, I was going to drop the name. Like, so you yeah. pulled the Gary V. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Gary V starts his YouTube channel and wine library and we were in a different market than him, but he introduced all like retailers and collectors to this selling wine online. So it became a price war pretty quickly. Mm. Um, so we saw the writing on the wall and we exited fairly soon as that started happening before our margins started um, decreasing. And that, I mean, it was, it was good and we had a great exit, but it was a really big learning lesson for us of saying like, Hey, pay attention to industry trends. Right. And also like, be positive in, in our business, but also be realistic. Like in, in wine, um, especially if you're competing, like we're selling like the same product as somebody else, mm -hmm. we're not really adding that much more value that our customers are going to be willing to pay more. So the, the only real competition would be then on price. So we, we knew that our margins were going to go down and effectively affect our EBITDA, which is how businesses are valued. So right. we exited at exactly the right time. Um, and it was a good learning lesson for us to just keep our eye on, on the ball of what are the industry trends. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I think um, there's, well, business models, when it comes to business models, I have this theory, and I may be wrong, maybe you can help me out a little bit, uh, a little bit on this. But uh, when when you're when you're not the creator of the product, there's, uh, there's a you have somewhat of a limit uh, on, on the, the amount of value or the, the the leeway that you have in creating that, you know, that set value, for example, if a distribution company, it's a, it's a, you know, a wine company, right. Mm -hmm. And you're distributing, uh, were you guys uh, making your own wine or no? No, no, we were just uh, retailing and brokering for collectors. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, I mean, I think it's one of the things that, that, uh, you know, for example, coming in and looking at that in my, in my products company, my service company, in my distribution company. Um, it, it's also one of those things that uh, can sometimes be just kind of dropped into the same bucket. However, it's very different business models, um, you know, coming into it. Why? Because you have uh, control over certain different areas, uh, not necessarily the overall, you know, product. So it, it's interesting. And, and, it's very cool to see that, like you said, you saw the writing on the wall and you knew when to exit. Um, so what, what does that look like? I mean, tell me a little bit about um, uh, exit factor and the way that you guys kind of, you know, look at businesses. How do you value a business? Uh, I mean, that's a very common question that, you know, we, we're always getting. Um, so uh, break that down for us if you can. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so exit factors are consulting division. So we help people prepare to buy and sell companies. Um, and then, uh, we also have a business brokerage division where we're actually doing the transactions, right? Mm. We're acting as the broker or the intermediary, but really when you're looking at valuing a company, which is the most common question I get to is like, how much yeah. is my business worth? Right. Yeah. Um, am I rich or no? Yeah. So <laughs> all, all companies are valued as a multiple of a number. So it could be a multiple of earnings or multiple of revenue. Usually the multiples on revenue are much lower than the multiples of earnings. Mm -hmm. um, but I mentioned before we define earnings as uh, this, this term called EBITDA, which stands for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. It basically is like your earnings before you start writing off stuff to reduce your tax bill, right? Mm -hmm. um, and depending on the industry, that multiple can be anywhere from one to 10 it depends on the industry. It depends on the size of the company. So we always say like 
the, the multiples dependent on the quantity of earnings, like how big is the company? And then also the quality of earnings, like how, what specialties does this company have? Like what's your special sauce and things like that. <clears throat> um, so th there's a lot that goes into it. And those multiples are determined just like you would for a house. There's a private sale database. Um, and you know, on wall street, we can see what everything trades for right on a yeah. price earnings ratio it's out in the open. Yeah, but on private transactions, there's a private database that's shared between business brokers, investment bankers, business bankers, where we can see private transactions that have occurred. So those multiples are still determined based on comparable sales. Um, so same industry as yours, same size as yours, things like that. Mm, okay. Yeah, it, it's uh, a lot of, you know, what I see happening is, is people have, you know what, I brought in $200,000 last year. And, you know, you have the basic rule of thumb, right? You know, revenue times three, and it gives you a ballpark of, you know, what, what the potential of you know, the profit or, or sale point of the, the company could be. Uh, but it's, it's not always on the dot. It, it, I mean, there's so many just different variables that play into it. Um, so valuing a, a company is one of the big things. Um, now, what uh, what would some if if somebody was trying to look, you know look at different companies to buy for example I was just mentioning one one that we just acquired yesterday we were chosen home health mm -hmm. um, and but if somebody's coming in and looking at a at a at a company to do a potential purchase what are some of the the key factors that they they should be looking at yeah it's it's a great question I mean first I think if you're looking to buy, you have to realize like, what are your skill sets, right? Because mm -hmm. especially, you know, here, I assume we're talking like smaller businesses, right? So let's say right. we're looking at buying a company that's less than 10 million in, in revenue. And if we're looking at those types of companies, the owner is usually pretty active. So they're doing something in the company. And as a buyer, you want to ensure that your skill sets match up to whatever that, that owner's doing. Right. Mm. Um, and, and also sometimes you can look at it as an opportunity, um, a new group of buyers that we've been, um, seeing more and more inquiries through our marketing experts. So a lot of the trends in business brokerage right now is, you know, we were talking about baby boomers earlier, but baby boomers own about 55 to 60% of all small businesses in the country. Um, and we mm. all know they're retiring, right? <clears throat> oh yeah. Yeah. So 2020 was a, a blip of a year, but in 2019, 42% of our transactions were baby boomers, but wow. When, yeah. What I'm talking about with opportunities is baby boomers. If we're going to stereotype or generalize they really don't um, have a great handle on online marketing, marketing in general, right? Yep. So we're seeing a lot of marketing experts are like, hey, here's an opportunity where I can use my skill set to add value to this company, increase the size, and then exit for a higher dollar amount. So, you know, making sure your skill set matches what the owner is either doing or adds value is number one. That's the first thing mm. that I would look for in a business, because if you can't make that work, then the numbers aren't going to work either. Right. Right. Well that, and then I, I'll bring it back to, to like the man's uh, mindset um, space. You get burned out real quick whenever you don't. Uh, I mean, if you enjoy arts and crafts and then you, you're set it, you know, you're sitting it down in a cubicle, for because that's the type of business that you bought i mean it's gonna burn you out real quick it's just there's got to be um, um a connection right between between and i'm not saying i don't want to use the word passion because i think it gets thrown around on, on like on a, a, in excess mm -hmm. but uh, there's got to be something that you enjoy about that space something that calls you know to to you in order to put that you know energy if you're going to be the one you know actually putting in the work and then putting some, some elbow grease into it. Uh, no, I think, I think that's very important. Um, the, um, um, what, what's the ideal buy box? For example, if you're, you mentioned, you know, small businesses, and then obviously you deal with uh, companies that are, you know, bigger than, you know, 10 mil and, and whatnot. But, uh, if you were, if somebody's thinking about maybe doesn't have a, a company in mind, right. Or they don't have, you know, what's the ideal buy box that, uh, that you would recommend? Uh, given the industry, the, the, the way the market is right now, I mean, what's, um, based on like multiples of earnings or value or like size of company, uh, probably multiples of earning and percentages. Yeah. Profit bottom line. I mean, it's, it's kind of stuff. Yeah. So, um, the average <clears throat> business, um, if you look at all businesses under 10 million, again, in revenue sells for 2.4 times earnings. Um, mm -hmm. and that earnings on small companies is that EBITDA number, but it also includes the owner's salary. So you'd add the owner's salary back. 
Um, so that's the average rate right now. So I'd say like the ideal buy box is probably somewhere if you're looking at that earnings number between one and four times. Um, that also keeps you in the box also, if you're going to pursue financing, which we can talk about too, but there's tons of financing opportunities to leverage when you're buying a business. But even if you're not right, I think about it this way is like, you know, the business banks of the world, the JP Morgan chases, the bank of Americas, they have a pretty sophisticated underwriting department and appraisal department. So if they're, they're saying like, Hey, the average company is only worth 2.4 times, you know, they probably have a really good pulse on that too. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, one to four times earnings on, on small companies, including that owner's salary is, is usually where we're seeing most industries. There's a few outliers, um, but it's very few and far between that's going to trade on a multiple that's higher than that or a multiple of revenue. Mm. <clears throat> Got it. Uh, yeah. And the, the, uh, at least in my space, for example, real estate, it, sometimes you, we have, you know, we'll, we'll do a couple of real estate investments and we get a good chunk of capital in and it, it almost becomes, you know, this, this like shiny object thing that, that that's always lingering around like, okay, what else can I do outside of real estate? How can I, you know, diversify what I have? Uh, how can I create another, you know, stream of income that may be more passive than maybe. So that, that's where that question comes in. Um, I sit down and I do a lot of uh, consulting and coaching for, for businesses in different uh, verticals, not just uh, real estate. Um, and, and that's like, by far, I get like, that's the kind of question that pops up like 99% of the time. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah. Um, you mentioned financing. I sold a, I sold a business back in 2014 on seller financing. I think I could have done better with the terms. I just didn't know enough. And I think it ended up costing me uh, quite a bit. Um, I did well on the, on the sale, but still, I mean, I could have stayed in the, in the, um, in the actual um, revenue um, stream for, for longer had I thought about it. Can you give us some ideas on, on how to finance a company? Um, you know, if you don't have maybe all the cash, even if you have all the cash, what else can you do to kind of you know, maximize the, uh, the ROI? Yeah. There, I mean, there's really a couple of buckets. So first is SBA financing and SBA financing. It's not, not actually the SBA lending the money. It's mm -hmm. still a business bank lending the money, but the SBA guarantees that loan. So like if I decide not to pay my SBA loan, the government will actually reimburse my bank um, right now up to 90% of the loan value. Um, mm -hmm. for business acquisitions. And what that does is it creates incentives for banks to lend money for business mm -hmm. acquisitions. We all know it's very hard to get lending from a right. bank or a startup. It's really not that difficult on a business acquisition. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. So the SBA program, um, it, it, the terms are between five and 10 years. Typically we're seeing you have to put down somewhere between 10 to 30% um, of a down payment and then the bank will finance the rest. So that's the first bucket. Um, the second bucket for very small transactions. So like transactions that are less than 250,000. It's funny. We joke in our office all the time. It's like, it's easier to get $2 million than it is to get 200,000. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's just because banks have to make money on their loans too. Right. So yeah. below 200,000, <clears> the banks really aren't interested, but there's these, um, most markets have these things called CDFIs, which are community development financial institutions. And they'll have, mm. um, you know, in our, our markets, they're called main street loans or community advantage loans where you can get a loan for as little as $15,000, um, up to about a quarter of a million, um, and same kind of terms, you know, a little bit higher interest rate because it's a lower loan value, but you can use that. And then the last bucket is seller financing, like you mentioned. So almost every deal we do now at this point as, as business brokers and advisors has a component of seller financing. Um, and seller financing can look a lot of different ways. It can be just a traditional loan or note like you would have with a bank. Um, it could be structured with something called an earnout, where it's basically a commission payment to the seller, where like we you we generate a dollar in revenue after the transaction closes and we pay you 10, 10 cents, right? Something like that. Yeah. Um, that you can be very creative with that. But even if you're using bank financing, most banks will, will require about a 10% seller note on that. So that's that's where like, say you had to put 30% down for your loan, then 10% is coming from the seller note. So now you're down to putting 20% down. Um, but the seller note, the reason for the seller note we're seeing more and more is it's not really about the money. It's about the seller picking up the phone six months or a year after the sale 
if the buyer has a question, right? So it's more of that like security, like, are they going to hang around or are they just going to jet to their private island and never answer their phone again, (laughs) right? So yeah. So most deals we see about like 60 to 70% deals we see, there'll be some cash down from the buyer, a seller note, and then some SBA financing to get the transaction done. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the way the way that I did, um, thank you for that. The way that I did uh, my deal uh, when I when I seller financed that uh, first company, I, I mean, it was a pretty straightforward. They gave me a down payment. Um, it was a good chunk uh, of money, and then I stayed. I gave them a two year balloon mm-hmm. uh, with monthly stuff. Um, I, I mean, the interest was like super low on it. I wasn't really making a lot on the, you know the interest. However, I did agree to a six month um, transitionary period where I was still, you know, part of, I'll be, I I mean, I would be tapering, uh, away and coming in as a consultant basis, not hands-on. Um, but I agreed to that, to include that. And that's what made the deal stick. Right. Um, now that I think about it, I mean, I, I could have done a couple other things. Right. Uh, and this was, you know, a few years later, uh, a buddy of mine asked me like, why didn't you just get, you know, keep like 5% of the equity on it? like, Cause I didn't think about it. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, I just, you know, I got out of that deal, but I could have kept some equity five, 10% then sold the rest. And mm-hmm. I would have, you know, literally passive income from the, from the income being generated from that company. Right. However, I, I didn't think it through. I didn't have a conversation with somebody who knew what, what they were doing. Yeah. And, uh, and I mean, I feel like it, it cost me, um, you know, some opportunity there. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's important to kind of just see all the different angles on a, uh, on a scenario like that. What would you have done differently? Um, it, it depends. It really depends on the buyer. So actually like when we're looking at small business transactions, most people don't want the seller to retain any equity. Mm-hmm. Um, and because then it becomes a partnership, right? right. So it, it depends on the buyer, what the buyer wants. It also depends on the financing structure with seller financing. You could do whatever you want. If you're using SBA, the seller can't stay on in any right. capacity. So they can't be an employee. Um, they can't be a partial owner. They can be a consultant for up to a year. Um, so it, it just, it depends. Um, you know, I, I think we see very few, um, sellers stay on in, in an equity or an employment position, um, over time, just cause it, especially like when, when we're talking to sellers or like moving on for a new opportunity or things like that. Sometimes like we were talking about, like you were talking about with a, a seller note, you can tie equity back to getting paid out to your seller note for a little bit more safety. Um, but you can't do that with an SBA loan. So it all, it all goes back to the structure. And then the, the, uh, I'd say the relationship between the buyer and the seller. <clears throat> Fair enough. I think it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm just saying that, um, uh, because I, I, I didn't think it through. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, I mean, but the, I mean, the fun part about, you know, buying and selling businesses is there's, there's literally thousands of ways to put a deal together. Yeah. Um, so it's yeah, all it's about incredible. Creating, it's insane. Yeah it's all about creativity and, and kind of knowing the tools that you have and using those tools to most effectively get a deal done. Um, you, you know, a buyer and a seller in every transaction are going to have different outcomes that they want. So it's just understanding those outcomes. And then how do you use those tools to achieve the outcome for both sides? Mm, I love it. Um, the uh, so you started in in corporate. We'll take it back uh, here yeah. a little bit. Uh, I'm very interested in seeing. I mean, people go their whole lives being afraid in in launching one business, right? Or or you know buying one business. Um, how how do you make that shift from uh, the corporate? Uh, and I'm talking in terms of mindset, but how do you make that shift in, from the corporate onto uh, being an entrepreneur, uh, launching your own, you know, business um, in in the wine industry, and then just deciding to, oh, you know what, I'm just going to create this over and over again with a whole bunch of different businesses and make it uh, a business like a, a legitimate business model where where it's uh, what I'm trying to get to is like it's it feels like something that's daunting. You know, mm-hmm. you know, having multiple businesses in place. So you're currently, you know, in, in five, uh, and you've built, you know, many more. And so, how does that shift happen from the corporate space, where I feel like um, you have that? Um, and and I'll speak for myself, right? But but it's uh, the corporate space usually gives us that uh, that safety net, and mm-hmm. it, it you know, as opposed to that risk adventurous, you know, type of person that, you know, will come in and then just crush it in the business world. How do you make that leap? How do you connect the two dots? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. It's hard. Like I'm putting myself back in that mindset um, from like the day one. But I think first thing, like I had to realize is that 
you know, back to safety, I'm not getting a paycheck unless like I get out of bed and go to work. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's really the reliance is on me. And and that is daunting at first, but then it's actually freeing at some Mm -hmm. point. Right. Um, you, you know, the second big thing is I realized very quickly is it's all about sales. Right. So it doesn't matter if I have the best idea in the world, if I'm not willing to go out in the world and try and sell my product or service or network with people or do stuff like this, then, then it doesn't matter. Right. And I see a lot of entrepreneurs that get stuck in that where they're trying to like perfect their product, perfect their service before they launch. I'm sure you do too. And you have to get revenue in the door. Right. Um, Yeah. So true. Yeah. So, I mean, like I, I don't, I didn't come from a sales background. I I was um, online marketing and that helped us in our first few businesses from my corporate training, but um, again, looking at your strengths, right? Yeah. 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 But I did invest in sales training right at the beginning because I I didn't network in my corporate life and I, I didn't close deals. And and that was important even in the wine industry and in business brokerage, like all those businesses we've been in, you have to sell. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And then the other thing is just starting small. Like, you know, I I never, I never really planned for the wine store to be this big thing it became or an exit. It was like from, uh, you know, the few, few first months, it was like, just go out and sell a case of wine. Right. (laughs) You know, that, that, uh, eventually got to selling, you know, wines for the price of cars, Yes, like nice cars, not even the, the, the crappy cars, like the nice cars. (laughs) Yeah. And so like, I think you just start small, like, yeah, you know, like we, we have business plans in our business and 10 year targets and things we want to achieve, but it's like, what do we have to do with today to Mm -hmm. ensure that like, you know, there's, there's a difference between keeping your, your eye on the prize of your long-term goal. And then also knowing what activities you have to do daily to make sure you're in business, right. And you're making money. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Breaking it down. And and, I mean, revenue, uh, sales cure all. I mean, I've heard it before and uh, you have as well. And, and it's, it really, it really comes down to, to getting off the, uh, off the ground real, you know, quick when, whenever you're launching something, uh, try to, you know, start to bring revenue in as fast as possible. Um, one, one of the things that I talk about is, is uh, with uh, whenever I do uh, uh, consulting and coaching, it's, it's uh, the initial three levels of a, of a business, right? Now, level one, it's, it's probably going to be you, maybe one other person. The revenue is not there. You're, you're creating like the, the framework, the, the operating system, and then just kind of figuring out how things are going to pan out, right? But the priority is going to be, the number one priority is revenue. Um, and then, you know, the second, uh, priority after that is going to be, you know, fine tuning the process, mm-hmm. right. And then the third priority is people. So you have yeah. revenue process and people, it, it does, it goes against everything that uh, you hear, like on the, uh, on social media, like on the, 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 the inspirational quotes and everything people for, well, not on a level one company, because if you don't have revenue, you can't keep the doors open. Right. Um, and if you don't have a system in place, you don't know what the people in your company need to be doing. Right. So you figure out the revenue, uh, figure out the process, make it, you know, start to automate and delegate. And then you actually plug people into it to run those processes. Uh, but it's important to to kind of see it that way. It, it's a very pragmatic uh, way, realistic way. If you ask me <clears throat> to to look at what you need to do. Uh, at a level one company, of course, as you progress and, you know, jump into a level two, generate more income, plug more people into it, the, the priorities shift. Right. But, um, but it, it's at the end of the day, it's you know, sales, it's revenue, yeah. like get that through the door. Otherwise there's not going to be a tomorrow. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. No, I, I love it too, because, you know, and we talked to some companies through like our consulting and brokerage work where they're like, you know, and I respect it. It's hard, but they'll be like, Oh, I have 200,000 followers on Instagram. Awesome. <laughs> What kind of mm-hmm. revenue does it produce, right? Do they, you know, yeah. Do they yeah. just like you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is it? Yeah, exactly. No, um, no. It's it's amazing stuff. So, um, what? Um, I mean, we've uh, we've looked at you know, kind of like the some of the primary stuff to to take into consideration when buying a business. Um, you obviously prefer the buying a business as opposed to the building a business uh, approach. Um, and that makes perfect sense because I don't think it's sustainable, right? To be just creating businesses, bootstrapping businesses over and over again. I think it's a, it's a, it's a season. You bootstrap mm-hmm. for a while and then you have the ability to come in. Well, every time you buy a business, you're, just, you're not only buying the business, you're buying the mindset, you're buying the talent, you're buying, you know, the, the human capital that's in there. And that, I mean, that in itself can be a great thing or it can be a thing that holds you back. So I'm sure that you have, you know, kind of ways of catching that, you know, along the process. Um, so if somebody is thinking of buying a business, 
uh, and I'm, I'm trying to put myself in the audience uh, spot. What are the, the top three or the first three steps that they can take to, to buy some? Yeah, it's, it's a great, a great <clears throat> question. I mean, the, the first step is educate yourself a little bit. And we'll talk a little bit about before we close our how to buy a business course. So just educate yourself in the process. So you know what to expect. Um, you know, we do have some buyers that come in and, and haven't done any education on it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's very off putting to the brokers or the sellers. And you can actually put yourself in a, at a disadvantage very quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's, there are buyers in this world that brokers will not work with, um, because of they're not understanding the expectations of the process. Mm -hmm. Um, so educate yourself first. Second, I say window shop, right? So most, um, most small businesses for sale are actually listed on the internet. Um, so you can go to, um, like our brokerage website is tworld.com or the biggest, um, business T world, tworld.com. Yeah. Tworld.com. Okay. Or the biz biggest business sale marketplace, um, in the U S is called biz by sell. So it's biz by sell.com. And you can just search, like you can see by industry, by your market, like what are the businesses producing on those earnings? And then what are they asking for it? It won't disclose the business's name um, and it won't disclose the exact location of the business for confidentiality reasons, but you can start to get an idea of like, you know, what, what does a healthcare company dream, trade for, right? Or are there any for sale in my market in Arizona or Colorado? Um, so you can get an idea. So that's kind of the window shopping. And then understanding the third step would be understanding what you can afford to buy. So we threw out a few like, you know, percentages here that, you know, if you're going to utilize financing, you might need to put down 10 to 30%. If you're not going to utilize financing, you're probably looking at more like 50 to 60% cash to put down. So, you know, it kind of helps narrow your budget, right? If you're going to buy a house, you, you know, you talk to your lender first and what am I pre-qualified for? Right. So then that helps narrow your search too. There's not like in any given market, there's not hundreds of thousands of businesses for sale, but there are thousands, right? So to kind of narrow by your budget and then over time you start to narrow and in industries too, through that window shopping process. So that's what I'd start with is educate, do some window shopping and, and figure out what your budget is to begin. I love it. And in terms of the budget, I mean, at the, what's your take on this? It's you have to figure out what you can buy, right? In terms of how expensive the business is um, and if it's generating and whatnot. But uh, another thing, I mean, there's always um, additional expenses that may be undermined. For example, a cushion in operating expenses. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you normally I've heard, you know, three, uh, three months, six months uh, cushion. What's your take on that? Yeah. It depends on the industry, right? Mm -hmm. So three months is usually typical for businesses that don't have, um, heavy, um, accounts receivable or long payment terms right. or, um, big capital needs for like equipment. <clears throat> um, we do a lot in construction and trades. And when you get into some of those companies, especially like if, uh, we just sold a company that has government contracts, right. Which is oh, super yeah. desirable, but the government doesn't always pay very quickly. Right. <laughs> oh my God. They take the transportation business. I'm telling you about I, that. That was a uh, 90% of my pro, uh, client portfolio. It was uh, just government contracts and yeah, they're great. They'll pay, but they'll take their suite. <laughs> yeah. So like working capital in that business might be six to 12 months. Now, yeah. the good thing is usually in businesses that have larger working capital needs, the banks will also include working capital into your loan amount. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, I mean, usually oh, that's great to know. Yeah. yeah I don't know that. Yeah. Three months, <clears throat> but it, it, it will, some of the industries you'll, you'll need more, but those are usually like, if you get into the deal, that's where you just talk to your lender and say, Hey, I, I really like a, a six to 12 month cushion. Can we include this in the loan too? Mm -hmm. Wow. Amazing. Um, yeah, it, it's uh, buying a business again. It, it's it's a scary thing, right? Mm -hmm. Especially if you don't have any guidance. I know you guys are, are working on on a um, on a program, uh, you know, talks about how to buy the business uh, through exit factor. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Is it yeah. out yet or? Yeah, it's, it's definitely, we did our uh, first course actually in this uh, early spring and we're launching another one in the fall. Um, so we're targeting uh, starting the second week of September, but basically what it is, is it takes our expertise as, as brokers that we've learned throughout, mm -hmm. you know, almost the last decade 
and really give kind of the stuff that we've been talking about today. We talked about the first few steps, right? But like, what does that education process really look like? How do you structure deals? How do you find deals? How do you negotiate and win deals? And it's, um, it's just a live zoom call that we do with a small group of people, like less than 25, um, that lasts for six weeks. So it's like buying a business one oh one. like, how do I get started? You know, what's the process and where do I go? And, and really, um, you know, it is, it's, it's a moneymaker for us, but really the big drive is to give new business buyers, the tools to be successful. Um, like I said, I, we see so many business buyers that come in and they either shoot themselves in the foot and don't get access to the deals that they should, or they miss out on some structural opportunities, you know, of, of leveraging, like we've talked about financing a lot, or like maybe structuring the, the deal to be more tax efficient. So things like that. Um, but yeah, there's, that, <clears throat> I'm on that second bucket. Definitely. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I missed out on that puppy. <laughs> yeah. And there's just so much. It's, it's, it's very, it's very nuanced. There's a, <clears throat> like, like I said, there's a thousand ways to do a deal. Mm-hmm. And because of that, it, you do, you behoove yourself to take just a few weeks or a couple months to educate yourself, to make sure you're doing it right. And obviously after you've done a couple of transactions, you learn over time, you get more creative, but your first one, at least making sure that you're putting yourself in the best position, legally protecting yourself is, is worth the extra time it will take before you jump into just buying something. I love it. Yeah. And, and I mean, legally protecting yourself is one of the biggest things. I mean, that's why we have, you know, due diligence periods, right. Yeah. In, in, in business purchases and sales. What, what are some things that people should watch out for like during the due diligence period, if they're looking at a business purchase? Yeah, it's a great question. So the first thing I always tell people is the biggest way you can protect yourself is there's two ways to buy a company. You can actually buy the company, like buy the stock of the company, um, which exposes you to all the liabilities that the previous seller has taken out. Or you can do something called an asset purchase where you're setting up a brand new entity separate from the seller and you're acquiring all the assets of the business that's tangible and intangible. So it can be everything from like desks and computers to customer lists, branding, all that stuff. Mm. But what that does is it sets up a brick wall between the seller's entity and your entity. So you're not exposed to most liabilities. There's a few liabilities that follow the assets, namely anything that the government has attached to it, like taxes, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's the first thing. And then um, due diligence, really, I, I think the, the biggest thing you need in buying a business is you need a good legal partner and a good legal partner that is fluent in transactional law. So not just a general business attorney, but an attorney that does small business transactions. And because that person can do things like lean searches for you, put protections Mm -hmm. in place um, during due diligence and actually in the contract itself where you have repercussions. Um, So that's like, I say like all the time, like, look, I'd love you to use a broker to get a transaction done, but you don't necessarily have to, you know, you probably should have a CPA help you with your transaction, but some people don't always need a CPA you probably shouldn't do a deal without an attorney, right? <laughs> yeah. um, I, and I know we all, we all have love hate relationships with attorneys, but when you're, you're looking at something this big um, and just doing that lean search, doing due, due diligence is, is really crucial um, because then there's all kinds of other things you can look and do diligence, financials, processes, all this stuff. But if you don't have protections in place from your attorney, something's going to pop up. I guarantee in every deal, something will pop up after you closed that was not expected. Right. Mm. And sometimes it's a minor thing, like a key employee leaves, you know, or something like that. Or sometimes it's a big thing. You know, there was a lien on the assets that you didn't know about and now you're responsible. And you bought it as well. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So that's, this is kind of preventable stuff. The attorney can help with through due diligence. Yeah, no, I love it. Uh, well, the I mean, everything that you you talked about, it, it's so relevant, it's practical, and it's actually applicable to, to just a, anytime somebody's looking at buying business, I know I'm going to take a bunch of this stuff and then apply it on my own. So I, I thank you so much for your time. Before we start signing off, um, uh, if uh, somebody wants to get a hold of you, um, what's, uh, what's the best place to, to reach you guys and find out more uh, about the how to buy a business class and, and exit factor as well as uh, you. I don't know if you have uh, social media or 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Exit Factor, you can find us at exitfactor.com. The buy business class is just under our online courses. Mm -hmm. um, or if you have any questions, you can just email me, jessica at exitfactor.com. I'm also on um, social media, most active on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. And my handle for all of them is at Jessica Fiakovich. Um, so more than happy to answer any questions for your listeners that come up. Jessica Fialkovich. Yes. Uh, L is silent. So L is silent, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I, I butchered that at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. And there's only one of me. So the, the good thing is if you even try and Google my name and spell it wrong, like all my social links will pop up. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> so lucky. I tried to do that for Rafael Cortez and this dude in Brazil got uh, rafaelcortez.com and then the Rafael Cortez YouTube channel and all kinds of oh. stuff. So now I got to do at Rafael Cortez CEO. Yeah. Um, I, I don't particularly like it, but it's like the, the closest, most simple thing that kind of links back to yeah. me. So but everything's on the plus on side, <laughs> most people can probably pronounce your name correctly, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. That I do have that going on for me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. If you were walking, the favorite question in the world, yeah. um, if you're walking down the street and you ran into your 17 year old self, what would you tell that uh, Jessica? I would tell that person to be a little bit more flexible in their vision of the future. So Ooh. I was a, uh, I was like a straight A student, very focused. And I was like, you know, from the time I was 15, I was like, I'm going to business. I'm going to work in sports. This is what I'm going to do. Um, and it took a really big world shakeup, like our, our recession that hit all of us to knock me off of that trajectory I'd set for myself. I'd never even questioned it. So mm. yeah, just be a little bit more flexible in the future. You never know what it holds. Wow, that means a lot, especially coming from somebody who's, uh, you know, buying structured businesses, right? Flexibility yeah. is key. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, I love it. Well, Jessica, thank you so much. I appreciate your time, all the golden nuggets that you've dropped here. I mean, super, super high value to all my audience. I know that they're going to love it. Um, and yeah, it's been a blast. Thank you so much. Thanks, Raphael.